Good morning and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. It is great to have all of you with us today, joining us online. And I uh, just want to remind you that we are here today to worship the Lord because our God is great, He is awesome, and He is worthy of all of our praise and adoration and worship. Uh, one of the best ways to get a hold of us, if you need to get a hold of us, is there at the bottom of your screen, the email address, admin. At Covenant, you can uh, use that email address to ask us questions, tell us that you watched us, maybe even for the first time. And if that's the case, we want to welcome you in particular today. As I mentioned, though, we are here to worship our great God and King and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he calls us to worship this morning using Psalm 96, verses 1 through 3. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. And so let us sing to the Lord these songs of praise. We'll sing two of them and we'll begin with Exalt the Lord.
Lord our God, we are here this morning to worship you and to sing your praises because you are worthy of all of our adoration, of our highest and deepest affection, of all of our worship. Lord, you are God and you alone. There is no one else and there is no one like you and there's none besides you. Lord, you are absolutely sovereign over everything. You have created it all and you have created it all and us all, for your glory and for your worship. Lord, we are sinners and we, we acknowledge before you even now that we do not deserve this privilege to come into your presence. And yet, Lord, you have saved us and you have rescued us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we will just read here in just a moment, we are now your people. And Lord, you have called us to be your people, and you have become our God. And so we worship you not only because you are God, but because you are our Savior, and through Christ you are our Heavenly Father. And so, Lord, we ask then that you would meet with us here. Lord, wherever we might be, you would meet with us where we are. That, Lord, you would minister to us wherever we might be. That, Lord, you would... Uh, work sanctification in us who believe and salvation for those who do not yet believe. In all things, we pray that you would be glorified, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. In this passage, Peter tells us that we are now a distinct people, as God has called us out of darkness and into his light. And as a distinct people, we are, in in a sense, in a very real sense, and in effect, strangers and exiles here on this earth. We are different. We have been set apart. We have been sanctified. And so we are not who we once were. We don't do the things we once did. And Peter here tells us that we are to live differently than the rest of the world around us. And he says there will be a tension. However, even when the world speaks against you as evildoers, he says, Let them be able to say that all we saw were good works. And we know that as God's people, that is what our great desire is. But we also know in our heart that we don't do that perfectly. And we need God's grace and mercy and forgiveness for the times that we fail to do this. So let's go to him now and confess that to him and seek his pardon. Heavenly Father, again we we come before you. Again we confess our unworthiness. Uh, we, we do so with great grief in our hearts because we know of the great love that you have shown us in Christ, that you sent him to be the propitiation for our sins. Lord, we, we stand here knowing that Jesus Christ came and, and he lived the life we cannot live. He was the perfect uh, sojourner in exile upon this earth. He waged a good war, and he was perfect, and he did not fail. 
when tempted, he overcame, and he overcame perfectly, and he conquered the tempter. And so, Lord, even when they spoke against your son, all they could see were good deeds. Lord, we thank you for that, and therefore it grieves us because we know that you have come here out of the great love that you have for us, and that Christ has died in our place to take away our reproach, to take away our guilt, to take away our shame. Through his resurrection, to justify us and to secure for us our adoption and to send the Spirit into our hearts to confirm that adoption as your sons and daughters. And so therefore we are grieved when we sin, because we sin now not as strangers to you, but as your children. Forgive us, Lord, and we pray that you would would ensure us, uh, assure us even of our pardon in Christ. And that because of that pardon, because of the gospel, because of your love and the the, the knowledge of your love that never fails, we would therefore strive by your grace and power and spirit to live lives that please you, to live as, as Gentiles here, before the Gentiles here, as strangers and exiles, keeping our conduct honorable. Lord, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Truly, God's love for us never fails. And we sin, but his grace abounds all the more. And so let us respond to that assurance of pardon by singing, let us love and sing and wonder. As we come this morning to the congregational prayer, I ask that you would pray with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sing to you a new song. We sing a song of grace and mercy. We sing a song of forgiveness of sins and redemption. 
we bless your holy name. The heavens are glad and the earth rejoices. We praise you for the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can draw near to you as you have drawn near to us in Jesus Christ. We come with thankful hearts and praise on our lips as we gather this morning, as we gather as your people whom you have redeemed, whom you have bought with a price, the precious blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we come to you in the midst of need. We come to you with thanks, and we come to you with praise. Father, we thank you that even in these uh, difficult times, the gospel continues to go forth. That your word is not returning to you empty, but it is having its effect among uh, the nations, tribes, and peoples. And we praise you for that. And we pray, O oh Lord, that that would continue. That the gospel would be clearly preached and clearly heard. That you would be in the redeeming people for yourself. And uh, we, we thank you that we can participate in that. And we, uh, we add our prayers to those of the saints that you indeed would, uh, out of this darkness, bring great light as the gospel uh, shines brightly into people's lives and gives them hope and promise, uh, and gives them new life in Christ. We thank you for the work of the church in Quebec. Uh, we think of the OPC there as they um, have begun uh, a work there. And we pray, Lord, that even in the difficulties that uh, uh, church plants are facing now, that you would be pleased to bless their efforts, uh, that many there would hear the gospel and, and uh, come to you in faith, that the believers that are there would uh, be... Uh, eager to gather uh, with the, the church there as they seek to establish a new congregation. And we, we pray for them and we praise you for the work there. We also thank you for Pastor Aslan's work as he uh, has uh, uh, had this uh, debate on TV uh, with uh, uh, Iranian uh, uh, an Iranian, and we ask, O oh Lord, that uh, you would bless Albert, give him wisdom, uh, give him insight and uh, the ability to uh, respond in grace and, and speaking the truth in love that uh, he might uh, show forth uh, the goodness of Jesus Christ and, and the clearness and the consistency of the gospel, uh, the, the only worldview that makes sense out of the world in which we live. And we pray that you would uh, uphold him and we, we thank you for his ministry. Lord, we also uh, come to you and we thank you for the relative health that you have given to the congregation here. Uh, and yet, uh, Lord, we come pleading with you for our sister Donna. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would relieve uh, the pain that has uh, beset her through these treatments. Uh, we pray that uh, the pain would lessen, uh, the, the treatments would have their effect, and that you would restore her completely. We ask that you would be with Pastor Landis as well as he seeks to, uh, to aid uh, Donna to, to be a nurse and a helpmate uh, to her. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen him. Uh, I'm sure this is wearing on the entire Landis family. And we, we lift them up and ask that you would uh, continue to hold them in your loving arms and that you would uh, provide health and strength uh, for each and every one. Father, we come this morning asking that you would be with us. We have gathered, uh, even if uh, at a distance, and ask uh, that you would uh, bless our service as we uh, hear the word uh, read and, and preached and pray that it would have its effect in, in our hearts and minds as well, that we would not uh, leave this service uh, the same as we entered, that we would be changed and renewed uh, by the, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And we give you all the praise and thanksgiving. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word read and preached, let us sing our song of preparation, A Word of God Incarnate.
Good morning again. It's, uh, it's good to be with you, even if at a distance. I feel somewhat like uh, the patriarchs that uh, the author to the Hebrews mentions who uh, worshipped uh, at, at a distance from afar, um, and, uh, and yet uh, by the Spirit we are united together. Uh, I think as the email that Kepi sent out uh, this week, it's, I think it's been three years since I've spoken here at Covenant, and uh, it's been a Interesting three years, and I'd love to talk to you about that sometime, uh, so ask me when you get a chance. Uh, but it is uh, recent, uh, the recent months have been uh, what some have said are unprecedented, and I think that's an understatement. Um, historic, perhaps, uh, extraordinary. Uh, I tend to think of the, the term surreal. Uh, it, it's just been a surreal time uh, for me as we've gone through the shelter in place and the pandemic. Um, and so... Uh, what, I, what I've seen, I, I've seen uh, last year we finished out the school year online, uh, trying to teach uh, second semester seniors uh, via the internet has been, uh, was a very difficult, probably one of the most difficult teaching assignments I've had uh, in my career. And, and I think the thing that struck me most about that um, was um, to see the look of almost hopelessness uh, on their faces. Uh, in their eyes. There, there's just kind of a, a blankness uh, to them. And, and I don't think that that sense is uh, limited to uh, high school seniors. I think uh, all of us have that kind of dazed uh, look. Uh, what is coming? What is, what is going to happen next? Uh, and, and so um, I hope uh, the sermon this morning will be words of hope for you. Uh, and they'll, they'll come from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, as I'm sure you know, is writing at a time very similar to ours. Not that they were facing a a, a pandemic, but um, a very tumultuous time in the history of Israel. Uh, Isaiah prophesies when he sees, uh, during the time that the the northern kingdom uh, falls to Assyria and and Babylon is threatening now the southern kingdom. Uh, And so um, he's watching his nation uh, descend into exile and, and perhaps... Uh, even ruin. Um, and so the, uh, the Lord raises up Isaiah to, uh, to speak to the people. Uh, and as I, if you remember from Isaiah 6, where he's given his commission, he's told that he will, he will speak to a people who will hear uh, but not understand, uh, who have eyes but cannot see, and who have ears and cannot hear. Uh, and so, so much of the, the book of Isaiah is filled with, with doom and, and judgment and, and, and fire and destruction. And, and yet, uh, towards the second half or maybe even the latter third of the book, Isaiah uh, turns to words of hope. And uh, you, you all know those famous words from Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort, O oh my people. Uh, and, and so, with chapter 40, he, he turns and begins uh, to speak tenderly uh, to the people, uh, because he has words of great hope for the people that the Lord will again tend uh, his flock like a shepherd and carry them in his bosom. A- and these words begin to speak hope to the people. And I-, I believe that will be true of Isaiah 43 as well. Uh, and I'll be reading that. So we'll uh, look at the first uh, 21 verses of Isaiah chapter 43. Hear the word of the Lord. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, 
peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. All the nations gather together, and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right, and let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, And you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. And henceforth I am He. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I send to Babylon, and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King." Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the Lord, the, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Thus far the reading of God's Word. Let's pray. Father, we ask as we come to Your Word this morning that You would indeed speak to us through it and by Your Spirit. We pray that we would take heart, that we would find comfort and hope in the words that You spoke thousands of years ago to Your people, and they ring true to us today. We pray Your blessing upon us as we, as we sit under the ministry of the Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text this morning begins with that phrase, but now. It seems almost insignificant. Um, but it is a grand word of hope. As, we, as you look through the Old Testament, you see this phrase, but now, again and again, in very crucial situations. What this word, this phrase is bringing is a new perspective. Uh, in spite of their situation, in spite of their circumstances, but now introduces a reason for hope. This same phrase was used when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, fearing for their lives. But now Joseph is second to Pharaoh. But now is used when Israel's cries to the Lord's in slavery uh, are lifted up. But now the Lord hears the cries of His people. As Israel is perched on the edge of the Promised Land, about to enter into Canaan, we hear again that word, but now. And so with this phrase, God is introducing some of His most precious and glorious promises to His people experiencing difficult times, uncertainty, people under siege, people enduring hardship, to a people uh, who are facing a looming exile. The Lord has here in Isaiah 43 a series of reminders for His people, promises to His people to give them hope. But now, Isaiah says to his people. And I think this but now is for us as well today. While this was uh, 
still future for Israel in, in their day. It is for us present. But now the Lord is about to do something remarkable. And so we'll see in this uh, passage this morning, we'll see four things that the Lord reminds His people about to give them hope. And the first is that there are redeemed people. That they're, they've been reconciled to God and to one another. They've been regenerated. And God will one day, fourthly, reorder all of creation. Well, let's look at that. Let's look at that first, but now. The, the, and, and he begins, uh, the Lord begins through the prophet Isaiah where you'd expect a people facing unprecedented times. He reminds them that they are a redeemed people. And that's why you and I can hope in the situation we find ourselves today. We are redeemed. We have been bought with a price. We need not fear because we belong to the Lord. Redemption, I'm sure you all know, is is to regain possession. The Lord pays a price for something that rightly belongs to Him. They had been owned by another. And God is buying them back. I remember as a kid, I, I grew up just down the street off of Lee Avenue here, and we would, my friends and I would walk up and down Southwest Expressway where the, what the light rail runs now, but it were once railroad tracks, and we would collect bottles. You know, back then they didn't even have aluminum cans, it was bottles. And we'd collect bottles and take them to 7-Eleven, uh, and we'd get a nickel a bottle, and we would be able, with, a, with three bottles, we were able to buy another soda and a candy bar. So that tells you how old I am. But they were redeeming. The 7-Eleven was buying back something that belonged to them. And that's much the same with the Lord. He, he's purchasing back a people that belong to Him. And, and you see the prior claim that the Lord has on these people. He says, but now, says the Lord, verse 1, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel. See, we belong to the Lord, and yet in His grace and mercy, He purchases us back. He redeems us. And, and notice again, uh, this, accomplish, this redemption is not only accomplished, but look what He does. He says in verse 3, I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. You see, God is paying a price for Old Testament Israel, and He pays a price for us through Jesus Christ. He has redeemed us and we have hope. Men are given in exchange for us. Peoples. He's paid the price. Now I think obviously the original audience, what they have in mind here is Israel's redemption out of slavery in Egypt. But I think it's a mistake to think of this as merely historical. Merely applying to the physical, earthly nation of Israel. That, that redemption, that, that release from slavery that, that the Lord accomplishes is, is symbolic, uh, typological. It's a pointer to the, the release, the redemption that we experience in Jesus Christ. And so it, it goes beyond the literal. Notice here that uh, he, he clearly is speaking of the Exodus. He talks about waters and rivers and fires and flames. But again, not just, not just literal things that took place in time and space, which they did, but, but they're symbolic of something greater. The things that threaten them. Notice in verse 3, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Um, I'm sorry, it's not verse 3. Uh, verse 2, um, uh, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I'm sure that's a reference to the Red Sea. But more than that, through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Crossing the Jordan. Um, But when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame will not consume you. That what this is talking about is all those things that threaten the people of God. Those things that are a danger to us. God says, do not worry. Fear not. Take hope. We have been saved from those. And I think it would also be a mistake to think of redemption as just a mere legal exchange. It's me trading in bottles to 7-Eleven. A physical exchange that is, that is made. Uh, redemption in scriptural terms is always relational. The Lord is redeeming for Himself a people. Note again the, the personal uh, elements here. Um, he says, fear not for I have redeemed you. 
I have called you by name. You are mine. I am your God. I am your Savior. And then in verse 4, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. This is the Lord God Almighty. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who created all things. And He's saying to His sinful people, you are precious in my sight. And you're honored and I love you. We need not fear. We have great hope because the Lord has redeemed us and He loves us. And if this is true of ancient Israel, how much more so those of us in Christ? You know, I even hesitate to to watch the news anymore. I, I refuse to watch television news and I rarely listen to it on the radio in my car. Because so much of it is doom and gloom. While it may be very real, I'm not denying the reality of what we're facing. But see, it it takes my focus away from hearing the Lord say, but now, but now, you are mine. You are loved. You're precious to me. Why do you fear these things? I love you. And I have redeemed you. Notice in verse 5 through 7, we have that second promise, uh, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Uh, the relationship has been restored with ancient Israel. The, the cause of separation has been fixed, healed. Notice in verse 5, Fear not, for I am with you. The God of all creation is with His people. And then there's that reconciliation not only with the Lord, but also with other, other believers. He says, I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. To the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons and daughters from afar. God is reconciling Himself a people. And He's still at that today. He is in the business of reconciliation. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You know, we live in a, in a society today that has never, at least in my lifetime, been more divided. We're divided politically. We're divided socially. We're divided racially. And yet God, in His great work, is reconciling to Himself. Even the body of Christ has begun to fracture. But we need to remember that the Lord is reconciling us to Himself and to one another. We don't need to fear because the Lord is with us. Again, notice the relational aspect of this. My sons, my daughters. He speaks of offspring, that same term that's used in Genesis to speak of Abraham and the greatness of the promises to God. We're in union with one another. And we're in union with Christ. And there's hope in that. We have the hope of the communion of saints. And that ought to give us a different perspective as we face these trials. And again, this is in no way limited to the Exodus. Again, verse 6, I will bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. All of God's people will be reunited, reconciled to one another. The east, the west, the north, the south. Christ has done this. And He is doing this now. Even in the midst of the trials and tribulations we face, God is reconciling for Himself a people. The Gospel is going forth. And again, it speaks of a new creation. Created, formed, made. All of these are terms that are straight straight from Genesis 1. Uh, God has created all things and He's renewing them and restoring them and reuniting them. He commands the earth. And that's the other thing we need to remember. God is in control. Right? God is sovereign. Our God is sovereign. We sing that. Oh, Father, You are sovereign. But too often Christians don't behave as if God is sovereign. God is in control. He has ordained everything that we are undergoing today as a nation. Everything we're going uh, through as a people, as a human race, God has ordained. And it's for His glory and for our good, ultimately. And there's hope there. 
this reconciliation will ultimately result uh, in all creation be reunited and reconciled to Him. All creation obeys God's commands. Human, human beings are the only ones who disobey God's commands. Have you ever thought about that? We, the pinnacle of God's creation, are the ones who rebel against Him. You see, and this is where all God's work of reconciliation, we have to realize that God is the only one who can reconcile us as to Himself, obviously, but to one another as well. And this is the thing that troubles me about all these efforts at reconciliation, whether we're talking political or, or racial or social, anything, is because they leave God out of the equation. There is no solution to the problems we face apart from God our Savior the Holy One of Israel. We need that reconciliation. We need that redemption. When we try to unite the, the races, when we try to unite the political parties apart from Christ, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. We need that redemptive work. So God says, but now you are redeemed. But now you are reconciled. But also, notice in verses 8 through 13, he says, But now you are regenerate. He calls to bring the people out, and yet uh, they're blind. And, uh, let, let, let me read that. Verse 8 Bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. All the nations gather together, and the peoples assemble. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, verse 10, and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. And then jumping down to verse 13. Henceforth I am He, and there is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? And so God is in the, in the, in the act of regenerating humankind. This is an echo of Isaiah's call to the ministry back in chapter 6. Those who are spiritually blind. Those who are spiritually deaf. Unable, unwilling to perceive. To per understand the things of God. They're the lost. And yet he calls in verse 10, You are my witness, declares the Lord, and the, my servant whom I have chosen. God is fixing that. God is changing them. He's renewing them that they might have eyes to see and ears to hear. Notice again in verse 10, uh, that they may know, you are my witnesses, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. God is working so people will understand who He is and what He has done for them. Once deaf, once blind, now they can see and they can hear. He gives sight. He gives hearing, understanding. As He says in verse 13, I work and who can turn it back? Nothing can stop the work of the Lord. And we should take hope in that. He alone can save. Besides me, there is no Savior. The Lord declares and saves. I declared and saved and proclaimed. You see, and then he goes on in verse 12 to say, when there was no strange God among you. There is a strange God among us in the 21st century. And it's the God of self-help. It's the God who can save themselves. And that's why we're facing the difficulties that we are. Because we have turned from the true and living God and created a God in our own image and in our own likeness who can solve our problems. Each of these situations we face, there's always a human solution to it. We don't hear the nation crying out as a nation for God's deliverance from this pandemic. We don't hear the nation as a nation crying out to the Lord, deliver us from civil unrest. Deliver us from the, from the injustices of society. We try and legislate it. We try and medicate it. That won't solve the issue because the core problem remains. And the core problem is sin. We are in rebellion to God. And only God can change that. All these efforts are inherently flawed. Doomed to fail. 
modern society can certainly diagnose the problem, and they have. They've identified real problems, but they have no solution. I am He, declares the Lord. I am the one who saves. We don't need to reinvent society. We need to repent and believe. Notice the exclusivity of this. He says in verse 11, an interesting phrase, even in the Hebrew, I, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no other. Verse 12, and I am God. God alone is God. It's God alone who can redeem. It's God alone who can reconcile. It's God alone who can regenerate. And see, this is why a light shines in a very dark world. This is why we have hope as believers in Jesus Christ. Because we know who God is and we know what He has done for us and and through us in Jesus Christ. Your friends, your unbelieving friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, They're seeking a solution. They're seeking deliverance from something they can't see, something they can't name, uh, and they expect that deliverance to come from anybody but the Lord. Anybody but Christ. But in Christ, we now possess this. We possess redemption. We possess reconciliation. We, We possess a regenerate nature. We have what we need. We have great hope. And finally, notice uh, in verses 16 to 21, uh, we have that reordered creation. This, This work that God is doing will one day affect all of creation. Not just individuals, not just His creatures, but His creation. We don't need to be despair. We don't need to be unsettled. We can face life. We can face everything that God puts in our way because God will one day redeem us uh, and creation. Notice verse 16. Let me read verses 16 through 21 again. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. Again, a reference to the Exodus. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. All that Egypt thought would deliver them failed. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Even in the midst of darkness, God is saying through Isaiah that He is doing something new. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor Me and the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to My chosen people the people whom I formed for Myself, that they might declare My praise. Notice again, He will make a way in the wilderness. He will make rivers in the desert. God is doing something radically different in His creation. He's doing a new thing. But now a new thing is springing up. And what we see pictured here is nothing short of a radically reordered creation. Along with redemption and reconciliation and and regeneration, we will see all creation healed. Uh, Romans 8 talks about how creation even now is groaning under the weight of sin. And God says, wait. One day all of this will change. He will make a way in the wilderness. Rivers in the desert. That trackless, desolate emptiness. Once impassable, will become a way, a path, a highway well-traveled. This new thing that the Lord is doing, in, or speaking of doing in Isaiah 43, involves a transformation. Earth that was cursed by uh, Adam and Eve. Blighted, parched, desiccated. God says, I will reverse the curse not only on My people, but also the curse that, that lays on all of creation. Waters will flow in the wasteland. Wide rivers. All that stood as obstacles to the people of God. Obstacles, deliverance, the desert, the wilderness. In their place will stand fertile fields, orchards. And even those creatures that he mentions here that that inhabited these wild lands 
uh, become refined. They're no longer a threat. They honor the Lord. And again, I think this language goes beyond just a physical transformation. Without, without denying that He will one day create a new heavens and a new earth. What Isaiah pictures here is a removal of all traces of sin and its effects. The fall will not be remembered. The curse will no longer lay upon the land. Creation will be, uh, will be set free from that burden of the curse. Creature and, creature, creature and creation alike will enjoy a new thing. Again, far greater than what any earthly deliverance promises today. They seek these solutions, and yet they can't promise anything. They seek a different gospel. They seek a Christless salvation, and they seek an earthly deliverance. But God says, but now, but now I am doing a new thing. And and we see the end goal of all this in verse 21. The people whom I formed for my people, that they might declare my praise. You see, the end goal of all this is that God be glorified. That God receive the honor. Wonderful, glorious things that the Lord is doing is all for His glory. That His people might declare my praise. The redeemed, the reconciled, the regenerate are blessed. We receive blessing in this, but that's not why God is doing it. He's doing it for His glory. Yes, we're precious in His eyes. Yes, He loves us. But ultimately, God will receive the glory. His people are given drink, refreshment. And again, not for our benefit, but for the glory of God. So for those of us who by God's grace are redeemed, who have been reconciled to Him and to one another, who have been regenerate, we will one day dwell in a reordered creation where there's no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. But what does that mean for us today? Where does that take us? My friends, I would encourage you, I I would exhort you to take great hope in this. We do not need to despair. We do not need to worry what the new normal will look like. What we do know is what the new normal creation will look like. Because we see it in ourselves. We see it in one another. We see the work of Christ in the midst of darkness. In the midst of despair. God is doing a new thing. That hasn't ceased. God isn't sheltered in place. He's not threatened by the pandemic. He's not overworked by the, the, the riots that we see on television. God is in control. And we need to remember that. We need to take great hope in that. We can face these challenges gladly. And again, back to the witness aspect, God has called us for such a time as these. We are the ones who possess the gospel. We are the ones who can witness to those who have no hope. And we witness not just with our words, but with our life, with our demeanor. With the quiet confidence that God gives us. No matter what is going on in our lives personally, we know that ultimately God is using this for His glory. The Lord says to you, He says to me, but now, but now, remember. Remember who you are. Remember what I've done for you. And fear not. Take hope. We don't have to remember, as he says, the former things, the sin uh, that so easily beset us. God has forgiven that through Jesus Christ. And he's in the process of restoring and redeeming and, and regenerating us. We need not fear what the future holds for us. He calls us with a holy longing. He calls us to live expectantly. Not expecting what the new normal will be, but expecting this new creation that He's about to give to us. A new heavens and a new earth. He calls us to live in glorious hope. 
because one day he will return again. And so living in this perspective, clinging to Christ, our hope, we ought to give all praise, glory, and honor to our Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the Creator and our King. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for the promises that are all yes and amen in Jesus Christ. We thank You, Lord, that You speak to us from uh, these ancient words, uh, alive, active, piercing our very souls. And we pray, O Lord, that by uh, the work of Your Spirit, Your Word would have its effect in us, in me. As we face uh, difficulties, uh, may we remember that You have redeemed us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You have reconciled us to Yourselves and to one another. That You have regenerated us. You've given us uh, eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to love. And Lord, You've given us that grand and glorious promise that one day we will escape all these earthly difficulties and be in Your presence, in Your glorious presence, forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, give us that hope uh, this morning uh, and may we face the challenges that each of us uh, do with, with gladness, with joy, and with hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll sing, of, uh, uh, sing a hymn that speaks of that uh, work of redemption through the great uh, love of Jesus Christ. Hymn number 535, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. We have opportunity now to worship the Lord with uh, our giving to Him His tithe and our offerings. And you have uh, multiple ways you can do that. On the screen you'll see a a note about uh, using Tithely, the app Tithely. 
Uh, you can also send a check, a physical check here to the um, Covenant address, as well as have your bank uh, send a draft uh, to Covenant also. So uh, we thank you for your gifts, and uh, may God use them wisely uh, as we seek to serve him. We'll conclude this uh, morning's service with uh, the Lord's blessing and the singing of the doxology. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.